Uh, welcome to the fifth and final day of the 58th annual CAGS conference and to the fourth and final plenary session planned for this week. It is without question that this plenary talk is among the most important that we will listen to this week. And I expect our audience to arrive today with an open mind and an open heart and to be respectful at all times throughout this presentation. Furthermore, I wish to acknowledge that this conference is being hosted virtually from the city of Ottawa, which is built on unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. KEGS honors all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. Without any further ado, I would now like to introduce a special guest, Dr. Amy Supernaut, who has joined us today. Dr. Supernaut is the KEGS treasurer and associate vice president academic and Dean of the School of Graduate Studies at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Welcome, Amy. We are delighted to have you join us today. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, it is my very great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Evelyn Asiudu, who is a postdoctoral fellow uh, in Environment, Climate, and Climate Change Canada. Uh, Dr. Asiadu is a native of Brampton, Ohio, Ontario. I don't know why I keep saying Ohio. And in 2013, she received her honors bachelor's in chemistry from Western University. That same year, she moved to Edmonton to pursue her doctoral studies. Her thesis work aimed to identify chemicals in oil, sands, wastewater, and understand how long those chemicals take to degrade. Her volunteer activities have centered around environmental sustainability and the promotion of diversity in science. Last summer, Evelyn published an article in Maclean's magazine entitled, Canadian Universities Must Collect Race-Based Data, in which she argued that the absence of this information renders the experiences of racialized people untenable and provides no incentive for change. She defended her PhD thesis in October, 2020 in the midst of a pandemic, and I will now turn it over to her to introduce our featured speaker. Welcome, Evelyn. Thank you so much, Dr. Silverman. And I'm very excited to be here and so honored to have the opportunity to introduce um, the keynote speaker, Attorney Martis. Attorney is an award-winning Toronto-based journalist, and she was a 2017 National Magazine Awards finalist for Best New Writer and the 2018 winner of the Canadian Online Publishing Awards for Best Investigative Journal. Her work has appeared in Vice, Huffington Post, The Walrus, CBC, Hazlitt, The Fader, Salon, and on a number of academic syllabuses around the world. Her work, is, her work on race and language has influenced media style guides changes across the country. And she's the course developer and instructor of reporting on race, the black community in media at Ryerson University. This is the first of its kind in Canada. And she's an adjunct professor in the gender, race, sexuality, and social justice at UBC. And in 2021, the journalist in residence at UBC. She earned her honors BA and a certificate in writing from Western University and an MJ from Ryerson University. In 2021, she was named one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women by Women's Executive Network. Her debut memoir, they said this would be fun, is a Toronto Star, Global Mail, and Vancouver Sun bestseller. It is featured in on anticipated and essential book lists and including now, the Global Mail, BlogTO, CBC, Chatelaine, and more. CBC has named Eternity one of six Canadian writers of Black heritage to watch in 2020. And the book as of 20 moving Canadian memoirs to read right now. Pop Sugar named it one of five books about race on college campuses every student should read, and it is one of chapters in Indigo's best book of 2020. The audiobook has been renamed Best Book of 2020 by Apple and Audible. So recently it came, it became a finalist in the International Book Award in the categories of autobiography, memoir, and social change. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you and welcome, attorney. We're all looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you for that really great introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here. And thank you to CAGS for the opportunity to be here and uh, to speak about something that is so important and so urgent today. So before I begin my talk, I just want to uh, say that I have two acronyms I'll be using. I have BIPOC and QT BIPOC, and I just wanted to make sure that people know that BIPOC is um, Black Indigenous People of Color, and QT BIPOC is Queer Trans Black Indigenous People of Color. So with that being said, I am looking forward to this talk. I hope you are too, and we will begin.
Thanks, Eternity. It's lovely. Eternity, I, I know that you've been doing these talks around uh, campuses and uh, virtually for the last several months. So I'll start off by saying congratulations again for publishing such a powerful and really just a poignant webinar and really just um, allowing us to have a voice. And so uh, just to start the discussion, I was actually wondering, uh, spliced within the memoir are discussions about uh, how to be a token or the survival guide for token students in, in these types of environments. And so I uh, wanna ask about why you thought that that would be a, kind of a humorous approach for black students to uh, inter internalize and, and process their experiences? And why did you decide to do it that way? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. I So in between the books, for those who haven't read it, uh, there's like a very dry, humorous, uh, necessary, it's called Necessary Survival Guide for Token Students. And it's quite humorous um, situations that what a Black student may find themselves in. And it actually was one of the first original chapters of the book that I had written many, many years ago that still stayed in because I refused to let it go. And the book, when I, when I pitched the book to my editor, I was convinced that it was a humorous book. Like I was convinced that it was like, um, you know, like essays that young white millennial women write. And that's how I pitched it. Um, and my editor said, this is really dark. And I was so confused. I'm like, what are you talking about? This yeah. is not dark. And I realized in writing and finishing the book up uh, last year, I'm sorry, two years ago, that I had internalized everything and I had just repressed it because when you are in an environment like that, where you are a token on, on campus, you don't have time to feel sorry for yourself. You don't have time to think about it. You don't have time to cry. You just mm -hmm. shove it down. On the other side, people are telling you what you're experiencing isn't real. It's mm -hmm. you are making it up. You are militant, you are aggressive. This mm -hmm. is all in your head. And so it took me a while to figure out that it was serious, but humor was the way I got through a lot of that. Right. Um, talking to my friends, talking to my other black friends about crazy stuff. Like, can you believe that this just happened in class? Like this girl just said, like get over slavery and we would laugh about it. And having the laughter and the joy and the friends was a, a, a lifeline for me that I think is very understated. Mm -hmm. So those chapters are kind of meant to help other students who are going through these things and are being told like, you know, this isn't happening. It's mm -hmm. for them right now in that situation where they're in it and they don't have someone to tell them that. Um, and they can have a laugh and they can also know that they are validated in a lot of these absurd experiences. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. And I definitely appreciate it. I think that with the knowledge that universities right now are not, uh, they're not in a state that they are ready to deal with our experiences. Of course, you're invited here because there is the intention and the hope that through discussions like these, they will become better equipped, but mm -hmm. we're not at that, that state yet. So I think that this humorous approach to really just supporting black students as they do experience what is a reality is super helpful. So I thank you first for that. Uh, so just to take it in a little bit of a different direction, um, microaggressions. So this is a, a word that is now, I think, commonly understood. And uh, in a way, I think that it is somewhat uh, of a signal word and can be somewhat divisive. I say that just because people like you and I, obviously, uh, BIPOC, uh, QC BIPOC, understand what the word means. But in certain spaces, you say the word and it's somewhat of an eye roll. Um, further to that, we might hear it such that, you know, um, microaggressions, perhaps you're taking it in the wrong way, or this person didn't mean it that way. And, and perhaps it's on you to use it as a teachable moment. So, and this is the, the messaging that comes from many places. There's specifically, there's a book in 2018 called The Coddling of the American Mind, which does put the emphasis on the, um, the person who's experiencing what could be a microaggression and um, how that could be uh, inverted into a new moment. And so it's a long-winded question, but I guess the question is, how do we uh, get better as people of color with dealing with microaggressions? And how do we uh, get better as a society, people at uh, university campuses, about talking about them and, and I guess making sure that we all know that this is, this is real. 
Yes, this is a, a really important question. And there's there's two parts to it. Um, I'll touch on the, the societal part first. And sure. so I, I did describe what microaggressions are, but what's important to note about them is that they don't have to be intentional. They don't have right. to be malicious. They can be unintentional. And it's the little things that um, those who have the privilege to not worry about don't see. So it's um, sitting in class and no one sitting beside you constantly, or you being the only student of color in your class and no one, you know, your prof says get into groups and nobody wants to get into a group with you because maybe this is, might be the first time they're seeing someone who looks like you um, ever besides on TV. Uh, and we know what the stereotypes are of us on TV. It could be um, about your hair. Can I touch your hair? Your hair is coarse. All these little things that I think a lot of people who aren't black and haven't had this experience think of as bonding moments. Where are you from? Or you know, guessing, or your English is wonderful. All these kinds of so-called well-intentional things can also be microaggressions. Um, and it's it's really hurtful to hear that, you know, um, we're being told to turn it into a teaching lesson because even though we're in Canada, we don't have a lot of research on this. It is very well documented in the States, in the UK, in Australia, that um, even just anticipating a racist event or anticipating a microaggression, um, a, a microaggression comment can really make you sick. It can contribute to the, to the deterioration of your health and your well being. So there's a, they, they, they build up over time. One or two, you may hear them, but these start to build up and then we withdraw. We don't wanna be in class. We don't wanna be doing any of that. And so for us, I think, and in terms of other people, we need to start interrupting when it happens, but it shouldn't just be on the person, the, it shouldn't be on us. If somebody says it, you should be thinking about the way that you, that you say things. If somebody hears it and is an ally, you should be interrupting that. And uh, there's this really great gradient about being an ally. And towards the end of like being like the perfect ally, you don't just educate yourself. You know, you have to interrupt the behavior and then you have to change the behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's been on us to kind of be like, oh, we'll deal with it. But I think if somebody is, hears that, they need to interrupt it. And those who are saying it, we need to start thinking about the ways in which we interact with people of color, especially in this environment. 100%, thank you for that answer, attorney. I'm just gonna take a question from the audience. Um, and if this is a question that you feel that you need time to think about or would like to move on, just let me know. Um, sure. So this question comes from uh, some of the audience. They don't have the name, but it says, what does Eternity recommend to students who are experiencing racism on campus um, um, if they're unsure of where to turn? And I guess another way to ask that is kind of a, it's a permutation of the question about I've already asked about campuses and dealing with racism. Obviously, the systems are not quite set up for dealing with them and maybe we're moving in that direction. But in the interim, there's still black students who like you and I are former students who have gone through this. And what would be the advice that we give to them? Yeah, and you brought up a really good point is that um, we don't have the structure, we're working with what we have. Um, and so ideally, I think the best things that students can do who are experiencing with racism, because a lot of times I think they may experience something and they get sent to the very long winded name, equity, inclusion and diversity <laughs> office. And when you are, especially when you're new and you're trying to find your classes and just kind of survive, especially right now, you don't know where that is. You don't see it during frosh week or, or if you're in an undergrad, but you don't even see it during your first couple of you know weeks of, of school, even if you're a graduate student. So it's hard to kind of find that. And those deal with, with um, like human rights complaints not the stuff that we are experiencing on like a daily basis. So what I would encourage students to do is if there is a trusted professor they can speak to, um, if there are professors or instructors who can, you know, at the beginning of class, acknowledge that. Um, I'm also a professor and I, I talk a lot about in the first kind of um, week, we talk about communication, right? And creating a safer space and a, a space where we can communicate. Opening that up so that students know they can come to you. It could mean, um, for students getting involved in groups on campus. So there are a lot of like, um, you know, like the Black Student Association, for mm -hmm. example, a lot of like racial and ethnic groups you can join or just things that you love to do, you can make friends that way. And I think the friendship part, the support system is such an understated point. Um, okay. having, a, having people to talk to about it is important. And when you join groups like the, the Black Student Association, for example, if these things continue to escalate, you can write a letter together. Right. Um, the, the power in the numbers is so important. So bringing in people, sending that to a department, for example, or wherever it goes. And if you're not, if you're not hearing back, that's when public letters are also important. Right. Um, and that's how letters go public when people are not being heard. Um, so there's just some ways to deal with what we have in place right now. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for that. Yeah, no, I'm just 
processing uh, your, your talk still and, and trying to go back and forth between questions. I just have another question here from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. And I don't think that you might, I don't know if you know this, but um, can you speak at all to the differences in the experiences of men and women in these spaces? Obviously you're a black woman. This mm -hmm. is a discussion about how we as black women uh, experience academia. Sure. Um, do you touch in, at all in your book about the differences between black men and women um, in such academic spaces? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so first off, before we even get to, you know, like post-secondary, black men are, or black boys really, um, are significantly uh, kind of targeted by suspension rates, expulsion rates, dropout rates, and it's, it's often black men who are dropping out uh, in post-secondary. And so there's all these kind of factors that black boys are, are up against because they're seen as men from just the day they were born really as toddlers. Um, same with black girls as well. So I think for black men, they're, they're up against these stereotypes that have never really left. These are stereotypes that began in slavery that we continue to see today, uh, reproduced in different names maybe, but the same, in, the same malicious intention behind it, um, but that black men are dangerous. So you may be on campus and no one wants to be beside you. People may be afraid of you. Uh, campus police may be looking at you to see what you're doing, if you're up to anything bad. Uh, so black men are facing more surveillance. Um, they're up against also ideas about how, how smart they are. They deserve to be there. Uh, criminal behavior, inherent criminal behavior. Um, and black women, including black men, but black women are also really facing a lot of sexual racism. So comments about their bodies, for example, or exotification uh, being used as kind of like the racial, uh, like the novelty. And there's a lot of good scholarship on this. My girl, Bell Hooks, does it well in her, in her chapter, Eating the Other, she talks about this. Black men also experience that, especially black male athletes. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're, they are different and they are similar because black men and black women are both seen as inherently criminal, but I think, uh, and both over-sexualized and exoticized, but I think for black men, um, in more cases, it can be a life or death situation because there is the belief that black men are brutish and aggressive, whereas black women are more seen as like a social problem uh, mm -hmm. or having an attitude. Mm -hmm. um, but then they're also dealing with that added layer of being a gender minority. Yeah, Ugh, it's a lot. It really is a lot. And I think that, um, I think part of the issue is that Canadian universities uh, do a good job of um, focusing on the path uh, right now and or maybe on the path forward without, without first going back and looking at the history mm -hmm. and so as you say you know black boys and black girls are seen as criminal from the beginning we know that that's because of the relationship between you know black people in canada and the surveillance which occurred over time because of slavery so um is there, do you have a suggestion or, or do you think that it would be a good idea for Canadian universities to put some emphasis not only on Black studies, which would encompass its history, but in acknowledging the history which has led to this moment of, you know, we're not equipped to deal with Black people, even though they've been living in Canada and contributing to society for generations. What would you say about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it needs to, um, it needs to be embedded somehow. It needs to be Black history, um, whether it's an intro class, it needs to be there and it needs to be not just an elective, it needs to be for credit, it needs to be mandatory. And um, when I was creating the reporting on race class, I knew talking to other Black professors that a lot of students don't even know, or even just faculty don't even know that racism existed here in Canada. Uh, not racism, sorry, slavery existed mm -hmm. here in Canada. That, you know, Jarvis, Jar uh, Jarvis Street in Toronto or McGill University or Ryerson, they all either own slaves or create McGill was created with the money through selling people, right. selling bodies. So yeah. there's a lot of history that I think would benefit um, students as well as, as faculty. But when you look at, uh, and we did this in my class, we broke down, we looked at what had happened during slavery in terms of um, surveillance, policing, loss of opportunities, the ways that black women are seen today, the ways that black men are seen today. Um, it is the exact same and it's terrifying. So I think we need to be having some sort of education, but it also shouldn't be happening in a university setting. It should be happening long before that. Mm -hmm. But I think it would help for us to start understanding that instead of just kind of diving into the moment, 
Um, and on top of all of that, that doesn't just um, benefit allies, it benefits Black students. Oh, for sure. Because I didn't even know about this I know. I was in my 20s and I had to learn by myself. Girl, and, you know? Yeah, me too, yeah. I was shook. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was really shocked and like, yeah. how, why did I pay all this money to learn nothing about myself? Right. And, and so even if we can like, offer opportunities, even if the assignments are, for example, you need to like do an essay on these two books, but you're welcome to look at these other books mm -hmm. to get students kind of thinking about their own selves. And when you know your history, you know your power, but exactly. we're not seeing that happening right now. Right, right. That's the challenge. And so I guess that is a challenge not only for individuals, but for universities to take on as a whole, how to implement and include this history, which is you know not just Black history, but all of our history, yeah. um, you know, we're in Black History Month, but I think that that's important to, to note. So thank you for that response. Um, we have Corinne, whose hand is raised. I think that we can allow her to, to ask her question. Um, Corinne, go ahead. Hi, I hope you can hear me well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you for facilitating this conversation. Um, just to kind of give you a background since you cannot see me, I'm originally from Montreal. Um, my lineage is Caribbean from via IET from my parents. So, and I've been in, in schooling in Canada, pretty much both in the French and the English sector. And I've, I'm currently now located in Alberta. So I do have this kind of pan-Canadian perspective as well as a little bit of a global perspective because I've done schooling elsewhere. And some of the threads of your conversation um, you know, within the Canadian context, uh, we've been very good at sort of like preaching this multiculturalism. And I think that's why it comes as a shock to some of the colleagues within the university landscape in Canada to hear all these stories um, and, um, and be well equipped, uh, as you both pointed out, to kind of deal with that. Um, I had a question both for you in terms of, I'm looking for practical ways. I know that a lot of it is systemic, it's going to take time, but in the meantime, we were you were discussing about allyship, I'm interested in knowing, did you have any ideas in terms or suggestions in terms of not just policy, but how it, it could translate into curriculum? I think, uh, Eternity, you were alluding to that in terms of, um, you know, we should have those introductory compulsory course. And I think some of our indigenous uh, brothers and sisters would say the same. Um, but beyond sort of having a, this introductory curriculum, uh, I'm also interested in the professional development aspect and the faculty development aspect. Are there suggestions that you would give um, now eternity that you've gone from, you know, being the students to the faculty side, that you see opportunities that could be leveraged going forward. Thank you for this long-winded uh, <laughs> comment and question. Thank you. Um, yeah, that is a really important question. I think, yeah, definitely beyond the kind of intro course, there is there is a lot of work to do in the framework that we have. Um, I think in terms of professional development, I think um, some, and I may not be sure of all, but um, the, everyone gets this, but I believe there's like a professional development fund that, that folks get. Um, and so either using that or writing a letter to your department to see if they can allocate funds so that um, instructors can learn, um, they can take courses, they can educate themselves. Um, I think it should also be in a way mandatory in every course that you're teaching to, um, to have that conversation up front about this stuff. So. Um, for example, communication being ir irreversible, um, and especially language. Language can really be a detriment to people. So having these conversations up front, I think, are important. I think, um, I don't know, it's a really, it's a really tricky question. Evelyn, do you want to jump in while I think yes. about this? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, Attorney. Um, I think that this question, and um, Karen, I'm sorry, I'm going to turn it in a little bit of a different direction, but it kind of relates to a question that we've had in this chat about um, what can universities do to, to, get, to get ready for minorities? And it's sort of a related question. And I think that really it has to do with the collection of race-based data. And so I'm gonna probably beat this with a drum until the day that it happens across Canadian universities. But um, how can we help those in our community if we don't know where they are, who they are, if they're staying or if they're lead leaving? So in my opinion, a big part of this would be to initiate that you know, general survey, that general questionnaire or whatever it may be to take stock of who's on campus because that's, that's a huge part of it. You, know, you mentioned it, you know, touch on it on uh, attorney, so if I, so with many other black scholars, I mean, it's important for us to be aware that you know, black people do exist. Um, and 
to, to forward that, just to add uh, one last point before we move on, um, it, it's important for us as, you know, people of color, Black, Indigenous people of color, QT people of color to also recognize that there are Black faculty and staff who are also on campus who are, you know, trying to just navigate the system on their own, but many more often than not, they are doing all of the work. They're doing their work as, you know, in their jobs, academics or staff, and they're also EDI people, and that's a lot of a burden on them. And so um, taking stock of who those people are, um, giving them support uh, would be would be a huge thing. And I think this all speaks to the recruitment, retention, and, and measurement of attrition of Black people on campus. So once we have that data, I think that each campus will, will be uniquely positioned to um, move in a positive direction. Obviously, I'm a scientist, you know, you're an investigative journalist, among other things, attorney. I think that, you know, you got to know, you got to start with the facts, right? And so once you have that, it's uh, easy to, to steer in a direction which will be helpful to the community, communities you're trying to, to help. So also a long-winded answer, yes. Corinne. Hopefully I answered it. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> no, you did. You did. Honestly, it's a big question. It's a big ask. And I, I'm glad that you, you know, you suggested uh, what you did. And I like uh, the fact that you do have this fact base in terms of collecting the, the data as well. Uh, and then it will be a question of what exactly are we doing with that. But this is for another conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do appreciate both of you. And uh, I wish you success as well in your own journey with this Canadian landscape. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corinne. Um, attorney, we have about 10-ish minutes left. You had uh, put up some polls. Did you want to check in on those answers at all or how exactly did you want to use these? Um, I would like to, but I can't really see them. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, okay. I'm um, not able to see them, yeah. Okay, no worries. Um, so for, oh, Ian's gonna jump in. Yes, yeah, so uh, if we'd like to use the polls, we can actually just navigate to back to the landing page for this session. Uh, and there in the chat, polls, files, and people section, you can find the polls there. Uh, they're already preloaded. So if you'd like, we could send people over to start uh, answering those polls. Sure, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Uh, and Trisha's also put a link uh, in the chat that you can directly follow if you're, if you're on a computer that doesn't let you switch from screen to screen. Awesome. So Trisha, you posted a few questions there. And so I know I've only gone to the polls within the last five minutes, of course, I'm very good at time management. Is there a specific question that you wanted us to focus on? There's one about um, university being, uh, having an understanding of racism. There's one about feeling supported. There's one to admin. Is there a specific question that you'd like people to, to review at this time? Um, I think, um, you know, they all have different, they're right. different folks. So I think maybe the first one, um, and it could be as simple as, right, it's just, does your university have a comprehensive understanding of how racism permeates campus and affects students? Uh, I'm just very curious to know what people think, um, like yes, no, and um, just kind of see the, the, the differences in, um, in perspectives on this. And so when I say comprehensive understanding, it could be that maybe you're having conversations, like you're having meetings about this, There's, you're actively participating in training sessions, there are places that students can go to seek help if they are dealing with racism. Um, it's really up to you how you want to interpret it. Right. Yeah. So those, are, those numbers are coming in and uh, right now we're at about a 70% no. Ooh. Yes, 17%-ish okay. unsure. 40% yes, so. Okay, that is, um, that is really telling. Mm -hmm. That's really telling. Um, yeah, and I think that, as I mentioned in the, uh, in my talk, we're still dealing with, like, for example, Western, who I've written my book now, and it was many generations ago where, where their students were fighting for the exact same things. And so right. I think not a lot has changed. And I've heard that from a lot of students, I've heard that from a lot of faculty, that a lot has not shifted. So this makes sense to me. I'm not really shocked. Um, let's see the next, how's the next one looking? Are you able to see the numbers? Um, so the next question is, would you feel supported by your, your university's current resources if you experience hate incidents or repeated microaggressions on campus. So we'll just ask people to vote now if they haven't already. Um, and we'll give them a couple seconds here to see the results of that poll before we 
and see the final few questions. So again, here so far we're seeing about a 60% no, huh? just under 60% no. So there's definitely, we definitely have some work to do. A lot of them are unsure. So right. um, that's also really telling because that just also means there's no visibility, right? Like there's no, nobody really knows where to right. go or what the process is. The infrastructure needs to be more clear is, is, is clear what, what you're saying, right? Hey, like Absolutely. Yeah. Just to direct people to the right places for sure. Yeah. Yes. There's people asking questions in the chat as well. Sure. And, we have just a couple more minutes, so we're trying to get it all squeezed in. Um, so we have a question. Eve Sorry to interrupt, uh, Evelyn. We actually have till 1.15, uh, oh, which oh. yeah, till 15 <laughs> minutes past the hour. So we don't oh, need to great. rush through this. Yeah, we have okay, about uh, close to 20 minutes left. OK, that's wonderful. Better. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. It's freaking out there. Okay. It felt like an exam all of a sudden. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know. I'm just rapid fire trying to get it in. It's my bad. Sorry about that. All right, so let's just happily go through these polls then. This is very sure. nice. <laughs> so we'll move on to the next question. I mean, everyone can answer as we go along, but next question is about faculty and staff. The question is, do you feel supported to uh, by your departments? Uh, do you feel supported by your departments should you experience racism on campus grounds? So this is for specifically faculty and staff, assuming that they are in the room. Hopefully they are. Mm -hmm. I think. Part of this question too is uh, the under the under representation of, yes. of uh, PC BIPOC. So um, we'll see. I mean, we can't see Absolutely. the numbers here, and that's okay. It's a little bit um, um, telling uh, to say if you are or aren't. But um, that's definitely part of this discussion as well, getting mm -hmm. um, those perspectives. And so, absolutely, we see here. And you're able to see the answers, yes, attorney? I am I'm able to see them. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it speaks to the the makeup of the room um, mm -hmm. that we have such a large amount that are unsure. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, thirty one percent say yes, they would feel supported by the department, which is also that's good. It's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> it's moving in the right direction, probably. Yeah. Let's keep it moving here. Do you feel your department? This is for admin. Do you feel your department has the appropriate tools, resources, and supports to help faculty, staff, should they uh, experience racism on campus grounds? And mm. so um, this is, again, speaking to the infrastructure, but specifically speaking to those in power, those at the top, kind of, if we say, top of the, the total pool or infrastructure designers. And so um, this is, a, I think, a good question, a reflective question for, for people in these positions. So let's see how. How we fare here? Ooh. Yeah. Also steep. <laughs> also yeah. a bit challenging here. So, so these are all kind of um, compounding together to give us a, a snapshot of the landscape of people in the room and how we're feeling with respect to racism in our in our campuses. And um, if most of us here are saying no or they're unsure, then uh, that speaks to the reason as to why we are having these discussions. Um, and so do you have any comments on this so far, Trendy, in themes? I'm, you know, I'm not surprised, but I'm also, uh, I am a little shocked at just how, especially for um, for admin, the the no is like a resounding like right. no. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think that we're seeing two things. One is exactly what I think a lot of um, a lot of us have been speaking about a lot of black or uh, faculty of color has been saying I think it's being shown in these polls, mm -hmm. but I also think it's being shown the the makeup of who is who is a person of color in the so called ivory tower. Um, sure. To be able to get to you know answer these types of questions. Right, right, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, continue. I'll ask the audience to continue to answer these polls as we go along. We're just going to jump back to the questions in the in the chat here. And so one question here is. Do you feel the university uh, you attend or attended, I guess, um, has a comprehensive understanding? Oh, that's sorry. That is actually the question from the poll. I apologize for that. Let's scroll up here. Um, OK, this is a question which um, I've been contemplating a lot. Um, this is about graduate students, uh, BIPOC graduate students, KT BIPOC graduate students. How do we navigate the power dynamics 
in graduate school when you are a graduate student and an underrepresented minority. So I think this might be case by case, but you went to graduate school and, and so did I, if you have any general thoughts on this. Yeah, I would love to hear from you first. Oh, sure. Okay, <laughs> okay turn it you're also, on. Also, you're doing like a wonderful job at this. I love, like, <laughs> I'm learning so much from you as well. So please. Oh, thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you. Wow, okay. head's getting bigger as we go <laughs> along here. <laughs> yeah, this is something that I've thought about a lot and uh, um, hoping to develop some, some tools, uh, supports for specifically black, um, black graduate students. And part of it, I think you've already spoken to in finding community. Um, I personally, without saying too much, had a challenging uh, PhD experience, uh, somewhat due to uh, my relationship with my supervisor. And um, part of what, what made it so difficult is that, um, I didn't feel that people were listening, um, people who mattered. And so I did my best. I, you know, I found my friends, I spoke to my parents, um, but it's, it's difficult when, um, it's difficult when people haven't gone through graduate school themselves to support you in that particular situation. So when you go to admin, when you go to um, the faculty of graduate studies or the ombudsperson, and there is no official way to, um, uh, file a complaint or, or launch some sort of um, formal decision or decision making or decision affecting process, that makes it all the more challenging. So how do you navigate student supervisor dynamics? For me personally, I tried 1 million things, which adds again to you know the success of graduate school or lack thereof, but finding mentors. So um, mentors who aren't necessarily within your field um, and mentors that aren't necessarily um, uh, BIPOC, you know, my closest mentors um, were uh, white male and females, uh, because I, you know, in the science field, many people are white male and females, and, and they were champions for me. And even though they understood that I was going through my challenges, having them uh, to, you know, speak to and bounce ideas off of and just to, um, I guess, make sure that somebody knew where I was at both emotionally and academically was very helpful. So I think right now the challenge is for uh, graduate schools to devise systems where that is more accessible and it's more fair and open that discussion between super supervisor and student dynamics because supervisors have a lot of power. And so that's kind of how I would start that, <laughs> that uh, answer. What do you think, Attorney? Yeah, it's all of that. You just reminded me um, of my own graduate experience because I was writing about race before we, before Black Lives Matter was, mm -hmm. a, like, was a, like a global movement. Right. And it was really hard to be a journalist with all like nearly all white, like 99.9% .9 all white journalists right. um, and instructors. And they didn't believe in any of the stories that I was telling. So I think I, I was thankful that I had a, an advisor uh, for my thesis that I really loved but a lot of times, like you're right, there's like, you know, your instructors, your advisors, they have so much power because it's, it's different mm -hmm. than undergrad, right? Like, it's very different. And for me in, a, in an industry like journalism, this is their make or break. So when you have people mm -hmm. who also don't even understand what you're doing, you're not going to go out and, you know, want to do better. They're, like, I almost quit. There are yeah. many times where I almost quit. Yeah. Um, but I couldn't necessarily figure out why I wanted to quit. Be, but I'm being told, like, this isn't good enough. I don't understand this. Nobody cares about this. Right. Um, and these are things, at least in journalism, but it should be everywhere. Um, you grade, you know, you grade work. You give feedback on the topic, not if, on your interest in it. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. those kind of get muddled. Mm -hmm. And so there is tremendous power um, mm -hmm. in in for super, that supervisors have as well as uh, instructors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, there's another question here in the chat. And it says, how can administrators or faculty best promote or celebrate black joy and achievements? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just celebrate it. You just do. <laughs> you just do. It's, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it really is, to me, it is not that it's not that difficult. Like I think we, there's so many things that happen on campus. I know campus is different right now because we're all online, um, but it's organizing more events. It's giving students uh, or sitting groups more funding. Maybe they want to put on plays. Um, I put on for Color Girls in my last year. Oh. And um, oh. it was the only one, like it, we had 
it had been put on at Western before. It was put on the year I was born and only white women were allowed to um, be cast in these, these roles for black women. But to say like that has been over 20 years of not having funding for, for, for black students to, to find each other. Right. Um, so having you know more of that, not just doing Black History Month, having stuff happen online where we have more events that are just outside of this month, having in class, fostering that environment. I think a lot of instructors, even workplaces are kind of like terrified when they're black like students slash employees are in one space together. And I've heard this a lot. I've no, heard I agree. like, no, you know, sure. yeah, I've, yeah. Heard, I've heard from like HR companies saying like, oh, you know, my my team is angry that the blacks, like the black people have their own like, like G chat uh, channel, but they're just saving memes. Like black people have their ways of having <laughs> right. joy. Like it's, yeah. it's, we shouldn't be robbed of that too. So if you can create a space, if you can, um, you know, pr just have more stuff, like more black, joy in your classes instead of black pain a lot of times the stuff we cover and we right. talk about is about pain and trauma mm -hmm. um celebrating achievements it has been shown uh, many many times that the achievements of black students and just black people in general they're never like they're always below everyone else's so mm -hmm. if you can do that if you can take your black students if you can give them hook them hook them up with an opportunity or to an event or introduce them to somebody write them glowing recommendation letters mm -hmm. because yeah. when you try and write one yourself you're considered entitled um mm -hmm. doing all of that stuff encouraging laughter in, in a classroom mm -hmm. um all good stuff to do i agree i also think that it kind of touches on uh, representation and and a lot of the things we've already discussed here. So um, acknowledging who are the you know black faculty staff uh, and and students on campus, um, like you said, providing them funding to 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 advance themselves, to organize, to you know create those safe spaces. Um, I think there's a number of, of ways to do that, but also to acknowledge the work that if a uh, faculty member or staff or student does take on these EBI roles, I think that that work should somehow play into uh, promotions and tenure and uh, award applications because we know that specifically, I'll speak as a scientist, but specifically for science, you know, the currency is publications and papers and specifically uh, for, for tenure and for grant applications, the, the, uh, the highest value is placed on these academic publications. And of course, that's we're researchers, that, that's of course important, but what about the community work that we're doing? Ultimately, as a university, we are a community. And so by supporting each other, that, that work should be acknowledged too for faculty, staff, and others. So I think personally, celebrating Black joy is you know, helping to uh, acknowledge the work that people are doing at the, out of the sides of their desks. Um, so that's, that's personally, I think, an additional answer I had to throw in there. Um, so we have one more question, or a few more questions here. Um, are universities a source of the problem of racism in society, or a source of the solution, or both? This is kind of a are, question. are universities a source of are they a source of the problem of racism in our society or are they a source of the solution or both? Ooh, they're both. Um, they are definitely a problem. <laughs> definitely a problem. But then if they resolve the problem as a solution, and I say this because um, especially in the university towns, the idea is that you come to university. You get to make mistakes, you get to drink, you get to party, you get to act stupid, and it's okay because it's all practice for the real the real world. You get to say what you want because it's gonna be okay. And the policies around um, that are kind of given out the ways in which administrators want um, gives a lot of people and perpetrators of this slaps on the wrist. So it is a problem when you have students who believe they can do what they want. It is a problem when you're in a university town and you have students coming from neighboring cities who've never seen other students of color and get to say things and go out into the city. So even though they're not on campus grounds, having off campus parties, going to bars and spewing this kind of stuff, sexually assaulting other people, that is a big university problem because the mm -hmm. culture has enabled it mm -hmm. um, and has created the environment where people are targeted and others get to continue to be perpetrators and are emboldened by that. So that is a problem, but that can be a solution with 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 a real clear intent of how do we how do we deal with this stuff? How do we target it? How do we address it? How do we go from saying we don't want to ruin this young person's life? to there are serious consequences for your actions because this may not be the workforce, but this is close enough. 
Um, and essentially, to me at least, what universities are doing is you're creating people who then go on to create other patterns, right? Mm -hmm. They're either cre they're either going to be reproducing the same patterns of abuse, mm -hmm. or they're going to be better for it. And so universities play a serious role in not just kind of that environment, but how people, like young people especially, kind of leave that environment um, mm -hmm. and how they treat other people. For sure. Yeah, I definitely think that your what your response speaks to the 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 power that universities have, um, you know, and, and responsibility within a society at, at large. Um, it also speaks to the fact that it's racism is systemic, of which you know um, university is one of those institutions. So that that does make sense. Your response, sir. So thank you for that. So we're running down in the last few minutes here. Um, how are you feeling? I'm great. These are great <laughs> questions. How are you yeah. feeling? I'm pretty good, pretty good. I, I'm, I'm so glad that I was able, been able to do this with you. And so uh, I'll just ask one personal question. Hopefully we'll be able to squeeze in another before the end here, but um, you wrote your book or published it in March, 2020. So that's the beginning of pandemic, um, the, you know, a bunch of changes happening in life, but it's been taken up so um, so well, it's so well received by, by the public. And so I, I know that because of that, you've been doing talks everywhere and you're super busy, but I'm guessing, I'm wondering, do you think that this is a moment? Do you think that, you know, these discussions that you're ha having, do you hope, how do you hope to see them progress once, you know, you're, you've moved on and you're working on your next thing, you know, in the interim between this important uh, memoir and the next important memoir or whatever it is you produce, what do you hope to see change? Um, you know, maybe on university campuses, but you know, in the conversation at large. Yeah, I yeah. So I left my full time job to just talk about this, and um, it can be really draining and it can be really exhausting. And I hope it's not in vain. And um, I'm really aware, like I think most Black people are, that this comes in waves. These conversations are happening as a reaction to something, and it's usually reactionary. But I think the difference this time around has been that in this kind of renewed racial reckoning, we finally included campuses. Like mm -hmm. finally, it's never been really talked about. Yeah. So I'm hoping that with this book, uh, I know this book is being taught at a lot of schools. I'm hoping that in terms of this of black student well-being and students of color's well-being, I hope that it 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 helps them and I hope that it helps them start to kind of act. Um, and they already are. And I also hope that we start to take it really seriously. Like I think now that we can see there's a problem, we have my book, we have the data, we have other students that we start to implement things and we just start, I think even just starting collecting the race-based data, um, having, having decision makers not make decisions without students of color. Like how do people come together, ha listening, sitting down and listening, creating these reports. I think that is all necessary. And I'm starting to see it happen a little bit. Um, I'm seeing students do it. I'd like to see universities continue to keep up with the students who are doing this work. So I am hopeful. I'm definitely hopeful. Yeah. Fingers yes. crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I hate to interrupt um, at, because this has been such a wonderful discussion. There was uh, someone in the chat who suggested that the two of you ought to do a podcast together because yes. you have such great energy. <laughs> and uh, um, so I'm very thankful to uh, both Eternity and Evelyn for your time and your um, uh, courage to, um, to speak about your experiences. It's not easy to talk about yourself. And um, I really uh, appreciate the um, time that you put into this um, and it's it's just been so wonderful and I think uh, I learned a lot and I, I know um, everyone else learned a lot as well so thank you so much uh, we will keep our fingers crossed and keep working uh, together to uh, try and improve uh, we do know that there's a long way to go so thank you very much um, and um, I am instructed to invite people to take a 15 minute wellness break make sure to stand up and stretch you can go to the videos that have uh, yoga, et cetera, or um, as I'm going to do, uh, go out and walk my dog. So thank you again. And thanks to everyone uh, who attended and uh, wonderful questions. So um, I'll give a virtual clap out to, to everyone and we will see you all anon. Thank you.